welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining uh, us today. Uh, just to remind you, this is our 28th webinar. So welcome to our webinar series on ethics and COVID-19. Uh, so these webinars are hosted by the uh, Office for Research Excellence in the School of uh, Public Health here at the George Washington uh, University uh, in collaboration with uh, the Bioethics uh, Interests Group and also our Research Ethics uh, Capacity Building Program in uh, Bamako, Mali with uh, USTTB and also our another Research Ethics Capacity Building Program with uh, the University of uh, Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of uh, the Congo. So welcome uh, everyone. And uh, today our topic is on uh, strategic lessons from COVID-19 for global health. And uh, these webinars qualify for professional enhancement uh, credit. And uh, my colleagues are going to send uh, some uh, guidance on how to proceed in terms of submitting your forms uh, for professional enhancement uh, uh, credits. So as our panelists are giving their talks, please feel free to use the uh, chat function for your comments and also your uh, questions. So once they are done with uh, their talks, uh, we are going to have uh, a question and answer session and uh, we look forward to uh, a great uh, session. So our first panelist uh, today is uh, Dr. Olusoji Adei, or in short, uh, Soji. So Soji is uh, the president of uh, Resilience Health Systems. He's also a senior associate at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he has over 30 years of leadership experience in global health policy, uh, strategy, and uh, practice across every region of uh, the world. In his uh, prior career at the World Bank, he served as director of uh, the health nutrition and population global practice, and also as a senior advisor for human development, among many other leadership uh, responsibilities. And uh, he is the founding director of uh, the Affordable Medicines Facility uh, for Malaria, uh, which is a public-private partnership hosted by the Global Fund uh, to fight uh, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So he has extensive experience in policies, strategies, and uh, programs. And he has authored uh, so many uh, papers and uh, books on health policy, health systems, service delivery, and quality of care. And recently, uh, he just published a book on uh, global health in practice with a subtitle, Investing Amidst Pandemics, Denial of Evidence, and Neo-Dependency. So, Soji, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Paul Mbivele and colleagues. I would like to really thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. And thanks, for, to, thanks to my fellow panelists and colleagues for joining us. Uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to uh, share some ideas and uh, tee up some, some items for, for discussion. Now, let's think of it as the global in global health, and let's also think of it as the ethics in global health. But today, we're not talking so much about uh, the biomedical dimensions of bioethics, et cetera, et cetera, of, uh, of COVID-19 per se. There are people who have uh, specialized expertise in those areas uh, far beyond anything I can lay claim to. Instead, uh, I will focus over the next 10 to 15 minutes on the strat uh, strategic and geopolitical dimensions of the lessons we're learning from the COVID-19 pandemic. As a premise that we need to acknowledge before proceeding further, and that is, while the technical and institutional dimensions of pandemic preparedness and pandemic uh, response are very, very important, uh, 
the strategic and geopolitical dimensions are foundational. In addition, they are not only foundational, they have multiplier effects on the biomedical, the technical and the institutional aspects. How so? Let's start from what might have been predicted if we were speaking three years ago, so a year before the pandemic uh, got going, or almost a year before the pandemic got going. You will all recall the Global Health Security uh, Index and the rankings on the Global Health Security Index, which at first glance seemed to make sense uh, in terms of the recognized technical prowess of different in, uh, countries around the world. What we learned in the first year of the pandemic uh, was that those rankings were not necessarily predictive of actual performance once a pandemic hit. And that in fact, uh, the quality of country leadership and the extent of trust, so social trust in the country leadership uh, was very important. So to be a little more explicit, uh, in the year 2020, for example, uh, the world saw what I think it's fair to call inept leadership responses uh, to the pandemic in the United States and in the United Kingdom uh, as well, just to take those two in the global north. And in addition, I also saw the same in Brazil and in Tanzania. So it, it, it was not just limited to uh, the high income countries. So that's, that's the effect of inept, or if you like, leadership ineptitude on a pandemic response. And that has a crippling effect on the extent to which institutions uh, can respond. So the first lesson that we learned is that unlike in those countries, there was, uh, there was, uh, quite competent leadership in places like New Zealand during the first year of the pandemic, uh, Vietnam and Taiwan. So the first lesson that we learned is that the quality of leadership is just as important, if not more important than the purely technical competencies of institutions and countries when a pandemic strikes. A second lesson that we have learned uh, is encapsulated in those emerging from the International Health Regulations or IHR for short. The IHR are very strongly grounded in norms and exhortations. And a good example of those uh, is the injunction against curtailing international traffic in the event of an outbreak, or at least haphazardly curtailing uh, international traffic. What we saw was that if our countries did precisely that, and that multiplied the effects of the supply chain disruptions, the mismatch between demand and supply for uh, essential equipment, diagnostics, therapeutics, and of course then uh, vaccines. A lesson that is emerging from this is that as we navigate this pandemic and prepare to avert the next one, or at least more effectively respond to it, it will make sense to, re to revisit the international health regulations. And perhaps instead of the extreme emphasis on norms and exhortations, pay more attention to the incentives and disincentives for countries to promptly respond and uh, report disease outbreaks because of the penalties they might suffer and also for countries to promptly uh, report the detection of variants of, uh, of pathogens. You also, what happened uh, when scientists in uh, South Africa and their government there announced uh, the, their discovery of the Omicron variant, uh, variant in South Africa. The, the response was quite paradoxical. It was almost a punitive response. So in the next iteration of the IHR or whatever its successor is, these are things that need to be taken into account. Now, there is 
plenty of literature, including models, indicating that cooperation is optimal in a response to a pandemic. But the reality is competition. It is not cooperation. Now, I'm not saying cooperation is bad. I'm saying that while cooperation is optimal, competition is real. And that is what we have experienced in this pandemic. How so? Once the pandemic hit, there was a breakdown in supply chain. There was a mismatch between the demand for critical products on the one hand and the supply of those products on the other hand. And in that context, countries that hosted those manufacturers, the manufacturing countries, if you allow that phrase, to very extent proceeded to hoard those products at the expense of the countries that, they, that did not have product manufacturers on their territories. And that hoarding effectively deprived others of what I will call fair access to life-saving technologies. Now, that's a form of a tragedy of the commons, uh, which is a phenomenon in which an individual or a group look out for their own interests uh, only at the expense of other members of the group when those resources are finite. What does this mean? If you look at it in terms of the strategic dimension, the geopolitical dimension, in the first two years of the pandemic, the message that went from the wealthy, highly industrialized countries of the global north to the lower and lower middle income countries of the global south is that in times of great peril, such as those of a fast moving devastating pandemic, you are on your own. That's, that's a clear message that went out and that has implications uh, in, a, in a bioethics seminar or in an ethics seminar, that has great implications for the global in global health. Because once the pandemic broke, uh, it became country health, it became sub-regional health, it was very parochial and provincial. It was not in the global interest. And you saw this manifest uh, in the way the high income countries competed for products and made it impossible for COVAX, for example, in the, in, in, uh, at the beginning to have prompt access to those products. You also witnessed export restrictions and the, the vehement opposition to the waiver of intellectual property rights at the World Trade Organization and a massive hoarding of technologies. Now, where does this lead us? It leads us to the next key strategic observation. And that is in global health and in development assistance for health, charity is not a substitute for empowerment. So while many countries uh, in, the, in the global south specifically stated that they wanted to buy vaccines, for example, the high income countries of the global north were having none of that. They wanted to donate. And you might ask yourself, why would they want to donate when this country said they wanted to buy the vaccines on an equal footing? Well, the reason is it comes down to the power equation. When you're in a donor recipient relationship, the donor controls the power and the terms of engagement, which is very different from uh, having people or countries on equal footing, the level playing field as buyers of a product on the market. And in addition to that, since we're in a bioethics seminar, we also noted the strategic messaging that came from the certain powerful institutions in the global north. Basically messaging that the global south was just incapable of producing those technologies. And that permeated many of the arguments against the waiver of the intellectual property rights. So since we are in a seminar at the George Washington University and we are speaking in Washington, DC, 
Let's take a close look at our local newspaper, the Washington Post, which in May 2021 carried a series of misguided editorials by its editorial board and raised an alarmist message about potential quality problems with vaccine production elsewhere, those elsewhere being outside the global north. Forgetting that before the pandemic came along, India was the vaccine producer for the world, for most of the world, at least the developing world. So those messages were there. They were also there in a message by uh, the current president of the World Bank who opposed the waiver of intellectual property rights. Despite the fact that, and he supposedly, according to Reuters, asserted that it will stifle innovation. But the fact of the matter is, many of those technologies are subsidized by taxpayer, the development. So for example, the Moderna vaccine is heavily subsidized by the government of the United States. So you have this whole strategic messaging going on that reinforces a sense that the global South has to be recipients. At the same time, there was a bright light uh, Nature Magazine carried, uh, Nature Journal carried uh, an editorial again in mid-2021, and I paraphrase, saying that the countries from uh, seeking a waiver of those intellectual property rights were doing so because they wanted the right to be able to produce their own vaccines without the fear of being uh, sued by the IP. Uh, holders, the, the, the patent holders, and that they were not asking for charity. Now, I would like our audience to please reflect on this. The countries were not asking for charity. They were asking for a level playing field. And I think that is part of what should be the global in global health. The, dif the difference between charity and empowerment. Now, we have a discussion coming up, and I do not want to hog the time uh, with this background because we have an opportunity to, uh, to, to have more and more discussions. Another bright light the, is the, the production of uh, Covivax by the team in the University of uh, in the team in Texas, who are now licensing it without all these IP restrictions. And I think this is the convergence of the brilliance of science, as well as an ethical approach to sharing technologies in the face of a common threat, which is what the pandemic is. That's another bright light. Yet another bright light being the advent of the mRNA hub that has been shepherded by WHO, which again is going to contribute to a leveling of the playing field. So when we sit back and we put all of this together, <clears throat> what does it mean for the future? I'd like to share a few key points. The first one is that countries should not feel bound by the old orthodoxy that governments should leave everything to the market. We now know that health is a matter of security as well. It's part of global security, it's part of national security. So countries, in fact, need to, uh, governments need to invest in the production, the manufacture of those critical health products. Uh, this is not a call for some government-only approach. No, it's create the enabling environment and strategically choose where to invest. Countries uh, should invest in in their own regional and sub-regional networks, entities like the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which has been one of the bright institutional lights uh, in this pandemic. Keeping in mind the market failure that we talked about, government should invest more in research and development and also provide incentives for innovation by the private sector. But this time, Instead of embarking in a practice 
whereby an entity like Moderna will get hundreds of millions of dollars of government subsidy and then turn around and pocket all the profits without sharing the, the, the intellectual property rights, any such government subsidy should come with an ironclad legally binding clause that in the event of a major disease outbreak, the IP will automatically be shared. It just needs to be automatic. You don't have to go around begging the pharmaceutical company. And also strengthening supply chains within and across continents, including some strategic redundancies uh, and, and, and uh, strategic reserves. And finally, investing in basic science, uh, education, and, uh, and research. So let me stop here. I'm looking forward to uh, a very engaging conversation. And once again, I thank you for having us. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Soji, for uh, touching on uh, lots of uh, issues here relating to uh, pandemic uh, preparedness at the global level. And you're actually uh, questioning some of uh, 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 the indices that we use, the Global Health Security Index and its usefulness. We need to interrogate that uh, further. You also looked at uh, the role of a country leadership uh, in terms of uh, uh, how you know we respond as a as a global uh, community. You also touched on the issue of hoarding that we all saw, but uh, you also ended up uh, by uh, giving some very very positive uh, examples, right? Uh, uh, so my question later on is, you know, do, is there the appetite to implement those strong recommendations and also to emulate uh, those examples and particularly when you are looking at uh, uh, the rich uh, 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 countries. Uh, so now we're going to move on to our second um, uh, panelist, who is Dr. Anna Amaya, who is an assistant professor at Pace University with appointments at the United Nations uh, University in uh, Belgium and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical uh, Medicine in the United Kingdom. Uh, she has been working in the area of uh, global health uh, policy and uh, her research has entailed understanding the impact of new global health institutions and issues on the health systems of low and middle income uh, countries. And recently, uh, Anna has been involved in examining regional organizations in the global south and health disparities related to COVID-19. Uh, so she has also been looking into areas such as the politics of global health, health uh, diplomacy, and the sustainability of development aid for health. So this is something that uh, Soji also uh, touched on. And uh, she has been working with several international organizations and uh, universities Amongst these, the Overseas Development uh, Institute and also the Pan American Health uh, Organization. And uh, she has conducted uh, some research on HIV and AIDS at the Department of uh, uh, the World Health Organization and the Committee for Development uh, Policy. So over to Anna. Thank you so much for that introduction and also. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, this is a really fantastic group and I'm glad we're all together. I'm really looking forward to the discussion later. So I do want to start by recognizing that the COVID-19 pandemic is not yet over. We do know that COVID-19 cases continue to be significant throughout the world with many countries still today experiencing the Omicron surge. And we also know that vaccination rates are still below WHO's goal of 40% in many countries. However, we have learned a great deal in the past few years about global health, and today I will be reflecting on what, in my view, are the three key lessons we have learned so far. It may not be a surprise that a common theme in my talk will be inequities, inequities in health in the structure of the global health system, as well as inequities in the response. And through this theme, I will be speaking about three strategic lessons we have learned uh, from COVID-19. The first of these is the need to address structural inequities at the global health level. Also, the need to keep health as a political priority. And the third one is really the importance of global cooperation in health. 
So just to go over them one by one, uh, the first key lesson that I believe we have learned is the need to address inequities at all levels, but above all, address those structural inequities that really stop us from making real progress in health. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 has exposed existing inequities within and across countries that we can no longer ignore. Every country has experienced devastating losses of lives, jobs, and a significant disease burden. But the impact on countries has not been equal, and likewise, we know the recovery so far has varied considerably. We also know that many of the people who were disproportionately hurt by the virus have the least control over or say in the system. And this is especially the case for low and middle income countries, many of which were already experiencing health or economic crises before the pandemic and also lack the fiscal space for investment in emergencies. This has not only been an issue of financing, but also an inability of the international system to ensure equal access to vaccines and other supplies that are needed to fight the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, we were aware that negotiations and decision making at the global level are very much dominated by the interests of high income countries. And COVID-19 has only highlighted those power differentials at the global level, but also regionally and uh, locally. We can expect real change in the ruling paradigms around global health if we aren't addressing those structural inequities and in representation and participation at the top. And addressing this is important because given the lack of a single singular authority above sovereign states at the global level, global health policymaking frequently takes place through consensus. And so it is in this context that inequities of power and influence, along with the capacity to participate in global health diplomacy, means that some actors can really shape global health policy more effectively than others. Of course, this puts low and middle income countries at a disadvantage. There is also interesting research out there that suggests that the history and the structure of the international system itself has legitimized a stratified system of political equals and unequals. And it is within this hierarchy in the system that very much limits these lofty principles of equality and morality that they seem to uh, talk a lot about um, in the media and in their speeches. We don't need to look much further than the Security Council in the UN here in New York City, where I'm currently based, where we have permanent members that have veto powers versus second grade members. In addition, we've gone through several periods within global health where the rhetoric has focused around primary health care, universal health coverage, et cetera, et cetera. But no real change has come about because we are still working in the same ways. Indeed, the lack of focus on health system strengthening, which is crucial to an appropriate response to a pandemic, really is the result of who is at the table making decisions and developing priorities. And when we speak about the priorities, we also see a reflection of the production of evidence that these priorities are based upon. We know that the global health research agenda is very much dominated and led by funders and experts from the global north, with a 2019 study reporting that only 19% of global health publications include authors from low and middle income countries. Moving on to my second lesson learned is that we need to keep health as a political priority. Unfortunately, we have very short memories and we already see a decline in interest in combating COVID-19 at a global scale. Indeed, scientists and governments knew the next pandemic was around the corner and had been calling for action for some time now. The Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is a group convened by the World Health Organization and the World Bank, published a report in September of 2019 showing that countries were significantly underprepared for a pandemic, exemplified by their lack of prioritization of their binding obligations under the international health regulations. And the board particularly commissioned a study to understand the global impact of a high impact respiratory pathogen pandemic and called on the G7, G20 and G77 members to follow through with their political commitments, as well as fund preparedness plans 
within their countries and efforts, um, support efforts in the global south by contributing to multilateral organizations. Unfortunately, this did not take place as we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we have learned so far is that preparedness is actually not costly, um, but governments are likely to only invest in preparedness once crisis strike. Part of keeping health a political priority is increasing funding for WHO. We have high expectations for WHO, but realistically, WHO's annual budget is less than the budget of many major US hospitals. And for a point of comparison, it's also around one fifth of the CDC's budget. So at the same time uh, within WHO, we know that the share of tied funding is also high with membership dues from countries representing less than 20% of the agency's total budget. And this of course limits the work, uh, the type of work that WHO can do. We have seen the emergence of new initiatives for funding, for example, through the WHO Solidarity Fund, but it should continue to seek other replenishment mechanisms. And once we do have this funding, it should also be distributed equitably. Among scholars in the Global South, there is a view um, that WHO needs to invest much more uh, in its regional branches and its local offices, rather than being a, what they see as a very Geneva-centered institution. The other part of increasing funding is for countries themselves to increase public sector funding for health. Last month, Nigeria launched a new domestic fund to address HIV AIDS in the country, which is a great model to follow, but most importantly, countries also should increase their domestic funding targets for health. We know that most of the countries who signed the Abuja Declaration failed to meet their commitments to allocate at least 15% of their GDP to health. And of course, COVID-19 has further complicated meeting these targets, but as countries begin to recover, they really need to recognize the importance of investing in their health systems. We also do know that many countries, including my home country of El Salvador, still have significant hurdles in collecting tax revenues, which also has to be addressed. But realistically, in some cases, low-income countries may also need some of their foreign debt refinanced or even forgiven. And as low-income and some middle-income countries transition to funding the majority of their health budgets, they will also require external financial support from high-income countries. And this support should also be equitable and fair. Just this week, we heard that President Biden in the US is proposing far less support to fight COVID-19 globally than what members from his own political party are asking for, which is wholly insufficient. And really, this is not an issue of charity, rather an issue of justice. High-income countries should recognize the benefits they have accrued over time through, yes, colonization, as well as from the global economic system. When support is provided, this should be logical and respond to the interests of the countries. It really doesn't make sense to support an mRNA hub in South Africa, for example, when intellectual property barriers to produce vaccines are still present. At the same time, corruption and mismanagement of funds is always highlighted as a concern, and rightly so. But as we know from these past years, corruption takes place in every country, including high-income countries. We need to consider the perverse incentives that an unfair system has created for countries in the global south, and think about how we can change that system, and at the same time, empower citizens to elect better representatives. And then the third lesson, which um, many might say is the hardest of all, is that for real results in health, we need to move away from the discourse of self-reliance, which really has negative effects on cooperation in health. There has always been a tension between national interests versus shared goals. And obviously global institutions very much rely on the support of their member states. And ultimately, and understandably so, the citizenry is more concerned with national rather than international affairs. While the pandemic has reinforced a sense of interdependence across countries, in practice, we have seen that many countries have acted in isolation. 
What I do believe is that in a context of an unequal system, there is very potential and increasing signs for greater South-to-South -South cooperation. I do see a potential to addressing global health inequities following the, the COVID-19 crisis. And in my view, regional organizations in the Global South have a role to play in this. Their increasing involvement in health suggests possibilities for a future rebalancing of power. And ultimately, if this is successful, this could result in a shift from a singular center or um, double center, double axis of dominance, namely US, China, or other um, higher um, high income countries to several regional blocks around the world, which means that they could have a greater role in global discussions around health at the WHO level, as well as in other forums. Each of these regional blocks have of course different policy approaches and styles, which will need to be managed and are likely to have important impacts in health. So just to summarize, we have to work within the current realities and also work towards incremental change. We need to see how we can take advantage of the current events and the current focus on global health to really change structures and in some cases, mindsets. Certainly a time of crisis can be an opportunity for transformation, but it will be important to see whether new forms of working will emerge or whether existing ones will be reconfigured. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Anna, for uh, you know, sharing with us lots of uh, you know, uh, uh, lessons, and you particularly emphasized on the need to address uh, the structural inequities at all levels. So within the countries, uh, at regional level, and also uh, globally, there are lots of issues that need to be uh, sorted out. And of course, you touched on the issue of uh, the power dynamics at both regional and at global uh, level. And I uh, also were emphasizing on the need to keep health as a political priority, right? Health is everything. So you're actually emphasizing on ensuring that we invest in preparedness. So for now, we actually start preparing once the pandemic strikes but what you're actually emphasizing on is uh we start preparing right now and we're preparing for all of those future uh pandemics and you also emphasize on the need to move to a truly global view of global health right so for now it's uh each country uh you know for for itself but you're actually emphasizing on a truly global view of uh, global health and of course you ended up by emphasizing on changing structures and also mindsets, right? So I thought that was a very, very important uh, message uh, coming from you. So I want to encourage uh, the participants to please uh, share their comments and also questions uh, through the chat function. I'm going to be going through some of uh, the questions that are already there. And uh, the first question is uh, directed to uh, Soji. And this is uh, with regards to international health regulations. How do we operationalize the disincentives you mentioned? So incentives are easier, right, to manage, but how do you operationalize the disincentives? Thanks very much. Uh, that's, a, that's, a great, uh, that's a great question. I think with specific reference to the IHR, and keeping in mind the construct uh, of the World Health Organization and, and its relationship with, it, with its member states. I think that the way to go is a restructuring of the incentives and an introduction of other incentives. Let me give uh, two examples and then we'll come to the, the, the question of disincentives. One very explicit incentive should be or could be if a country reports a disease outbreak that country is guaranteed rapid and explicit technical support as well as financial support to mitigate the economic the short-term economic effects of that disease outbreak otherwise there is little or no rational basis for a politically sensitive government to rush into acknowledging that it has 
uh, an imminent disease outbreak on its hands. I'm not talking about what is biomedically right or wrong now, I'm just talking about the political realities within which some of these, or many of these governments operate. A second uh, one, which is only partly uh, related to international health regulations, but I think it, it is related, is for the collective, i.e. sub-regional groups of countries, for example, to collectively <coughs> provide tax breaks for companies to set up factories in small population countries. Now, why is this potentially important? If you have a manufacturer in a country, a very capable manufacturer in a country that has a small population, that host country can absorb only so many, uh, so, uh, so, only so many products from that uh, company. And so all other things being equal in the event of an outbreak, that company will still be, will still be uh, able to continue exporting outside its home country. Whereas if the manufacturer is based in a country with a very large population and disaster strikes, there's political pressure that might prevent the manufacturer from exporting outside his home country. And we saw what happened in India when the, uh, the Delta variant struck uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the first half of, uh, of 2021. So those are two immediate uh, uh, considerations. Uh, a third one, which is actually related to the first, is for, for scientists and governments in a country that invest their own brains in detecting new variants of a pathogen, it ought to be that the world's response is cooperation, support, and mitigation of the negative consequences, rather than as we saw uh, a few months ago with the Omicron uh, variant to ostracize the country or the neighboring countries, which was the reflex behavior. Now, in terms of this incentive, because the international health regulations and the, the WHO do not actually have, they don't have the force to compel a member to cooperate. I mean, as you've seen, uh, we've seen instances where if, if, a, if the leader of a particular country, uh, for whatever reason, uh, doesn't like what is happening in Geneva, then that person can say, well, I'm going to pull my country out of WHO. Okay. And because of that, I think there are actually some intra-country actions that need to be considered. So if you look carefully at the case of the pharmaceutical industry, and you look at what, is, what happens in the United States, it's not exclusively United States, but let's take the United States, for example. Well, the pharmaceutical lobby is very good at upping its own lobbying contributions and influencing legislation. Okay, in fact, there was a nice cartoon that I saw last year of uh, the representative of a pharmaceutical industry uh, inviting uh, a Congress uh, congressperson and saying, now let us teach you how laws are made. Okay, so what you need is some is, is legislative reform that's going to shield, that is going to shield pharmaceutical products and is going to shield uh, diagnostic products from such lobbying. I know that's a very tough hill to climb, but it needs to be on the table. Otherwise, we're gonna be going around in circles on this. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sergi. So the next question is directed to uh, Anna. So Anna, please feel free also to comment on uh, Sergi's earlier uh, uh, response. So basically, if we think about uh, the current COVID uh, pandemic, and then you have uh, discussed the age old you know, power differentials in global uh, health. So how can we take advantage of uh, uh, the current uh, crisis to uh, ensure that we implement change? And what can you know, a government or institutions do to ensure that we are addressing those power you know, differentials? Thank you for that question. Um, just to briefly add to what Soji um, 
discussed regarding the IHR, I, I completely agree of creating those incentives and disincentives. Um, I, I don't know if any, everyone knows, but they are currently discussing how to sort of beef up the IHR and make them much more, um, make countries much more accountable to their commitments. In my view, uh, we should be moving towards a model that um, resembles much more something like the framework tobacco, the framework convention on tobacco control, something that really has embedded those um, markers of accountability within them. Uh, I, I think that's really the only way that we can all um, encourage cooperation for future pandemics. Um, just to respond to the other question about power differentials and global health, I think I, I completely agree that now is the time to really work on these. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, one way of, for this to happen is really for countries to group together and demand change, especially in institutions where um, multilateral institutions where the power of numbers really makes a difference. But of course, um, these are countries that also have other political considerations beyond health that at times doesn't allow them to do this. So I think, of course, number one, we need to be thinking about what are those points of conversions in these um, global South countries that they can work on. Um, usually uh, health inequities is a really important one, but what are the specific things that they can cooperate with? Um, in past World Health Assembly uh, meetings, we have seen quite a bit of cooperation on human resources for health in the past, uh, and even today, brain drain is a huge consideration, and so that was very much sort of a, a, a point of convergence. But we can also think about um, vaccine equity uh, right now. We are working, well, the international system is really working towards greater local production. But again, how can um, countries work at WTO level, WHO level to really work on addressing those uh, patent issues? Um, the other uh, way of achieving this is through, I think, citizenry uh, participation, really demanding this from governments. As I mentioned, that is always a complicated, um, really complicated thing because um, citizens are very much um, thinking about their own livelihoods and it's very difficult for them to think about other countries when they're undergoing internal crises as well. But really changing um, the way that these uh, governments approach health issues. And especially now after COVID-19, which has been such a turning point for many countries, moving towards that would be the ideal, using um, our fresh minds of the big uh, catastrophe that we've gone through and requiring change in these global institutions. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there is a question here that relates to the role of uh, media. So I want to think. Uh, I want you to think about this at the global level. We've seen several, you know, uh, public health interventions and also uh, public awareness, uh, you know, programs aimed at minimizing uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19. But at the same time, we've also seen misinformation and disinformation uh, at the global level. Uh, and which was actually aimed at uh, spreading some, you know, bogus remedies and myths, you know, fake news and what have you, right, around COVID-19. Uh, what suggestions do you have around the role of uh, media when you look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, the global level? So I'll start off with uh, Soji and then we can move to Anna. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I think this is a dimension. This is a, an issue that has multiple dimensions. And while some things are probably common across the world, uh, there are variations in the channels through which uh, they operate. So let's uh, let's take a few of them one by one. I, I think probably the most important element in this is the community engagement. Um, 
because unless unless public health communication uh, starts by engaging directly with the community, there's always a risk of a gap that will not be bridgeable between the communicator and the audience. So in fact, this is one instance where engaging with the audience from the get-go is essential. The second one is the pre-existing level of trust or mistrust uh, between the people and the government. That's, that's, a, that's, another, uh, that's another dimension. And if the people have had bad experiences with government or with authority in some shape or form, uh, that undermine trust that could carry over into, uh, into a, new, a new era and therefore undermine the, uh, the messaging. A third dimension, which I think is very important, uh, is to recognize that just being a good scientist per se does not necessarily translate into being a good communicator or an effective communicator. And we see that all over the world. We see that here in the United States. I mean, some of the communications have been absolutely brilliant and some of the communications have been ghastly or modeled, if you like. Then <clears throat> finally, in terms of uh, misinformation, especially, but not only on social media, you also get it on television. Um, I think this is where the fine balance uh, comes in. Uh, on the one hand, the freedom of speech is absolutely paramount. Is, is paramount, but it is also irresponsible to shout fire in a crowded movie theater. And I think that is where that is where the, the problem, uh, the, the, the problem uh, that we are facing uh, lies. When we put all of this together, and you look at uh, where political communications have been effective across the world, or where they've not been effective, or where they have been toxic. To me, one of the big things to keep in mind is the question, what is the society optimizing for? If during a crisis, the society is optimizing for the collective good, you actually see that the positive effective communications tend to drown out the negative and deliberately mis uh, misinformative aspects. But if the society is optimizing explicitly or implicitly for the interest of the individual amidst a pandemic, or let me put it differently, for the preference of the individual amidst a pandemic, that can combine with toxic misinformation to really undermine the effectiveness of public health programs, undermine the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, public health messaging, and then we'll get into the kind of mess that we have that have, we have witnessed in so many places. Back to you, Paul. Yes, uh, Anna, any reactions? Yeah, it's a great question. And I've actually been thinking a lot about this. Um, as a researcher, how can we better communicate our science? And why have we failed so miserably in many countries um, to do so? And I do uh, attribute a lot of the misinformation to um, similar thoughts and Soji, lack of trust on government officials, but also um, I think in many times we haven't been as perhaps assertive about what we know uh, works and doesn't work as we could have been. For example, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a big discussion around the use of masks and whether um, these were um, actually effective or not. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 was a new disease, so we didn't have the science to back up that masks were effective use um, for uh, stopping us from getting infected for COVID-19. But we did know that they do help in the spread of infectious viruses. So I think we should have been much more assertive in terms of proposing these initial um, interventions uh, as scientists and as policymakers, uh, we, but especially as scientists, we very much like to acknowledge uncertainty, but there are certain things that 
the public won't be able to gauge as much uh, or perhaps not have the time to look at the scientific studies, look at um, all of the information out there. They really just want clear guidance. And that's really what we have felt on um, at many levels. Uh, so I, I, I would say, number one, uh, increasing uh, training around messaging and both among policymakers as well as scientists and having scientists be able to uh, be flexible and be able to provide that evidence-based um, advice quickly. Uh, the reason why we got a vaccine so quickly was because they had already been working on a SARS um, co-vaccine. So really moving towards, again, uh, preparing for the next pandemic, preparing for what we know is inevitable. And at the same time, um, really looking at the media, engaging with the media, um, making them our counterparts, our partners, rather than um, sort of leaving them to, to their own devices. If we see misinformation, uh, reaching out to the newspaper or whatever it is and sort of clarifying any points. Because I think what has happened is due to the lack of, of real guidance, they've just filled in the gaps in many cases. In many cases, yeah, they are also responsible. So um, media training for the media would also be helpful in terms of science. Thank you very much, um, uh, Anna. Uh, so there have been uh, lots and lots of uh, issues here that we can actually uh, think about. There was the issue of uh, hoarding that was raised and I've seen some discussions uh, in the chat box there uh, even to the effect that uh, uh, one of uh, the countries that has been manufacturing, specifically looking at India, has also decided that they would also, uh, you know, hold some of uh, uh, the products for their own, you know, citizens. So basically it means we've got lots and lots to discuss when it comes to how we as uh, the global community can actually uh, respond uh, to uh, these uh, pandemics. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists uh, Dr. Soji Adei and also Dr. Anna Amaya for uh, taking their time uh, to share with us uh, their views and opinions on this very, very uh, interesting topic. I would also want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today and for your comments and uh, questions uh, through the chat function. Let's look forward to the next uh, webinar. So for now, on behalf of uh, the Office of Research Excellence and the Bioethics Interest Group here at the George Washington University, I thank you all and goodbye. Thank you.